All right, good to see everyone. Ooh, I feel like I'm a little bit loud on the mic. Uh, hopefully, it'll be okay. Um, can we give another hand to Pastor Eddie for uh, doing our announcements and presiding for us? Thank you so much, Pastor Eddie. Um, yeah, we're going to try to have him rotate in uh, about once every six weeks so that he'll be able to just enjoy service with us. Uh, not that being stuck with kids uh, is a bad thing, uh, but it's always good to be plugged into the larger church community. Uh, just one quick announcement. Actually, uh, I've, been, um, uh, I've been told that there is a blue Honda truck uh, that is blocking the parking lot entrance. Uh, and so uh, if that is you, no judgment, uh, but please uh, head over and uh, if you can uh, move your truck to a different parking space, uh, that would be great. I've been told that uh, there's someone just trying to uh, leave the parking lot and so uh, they're blocked in currently. And so again, if you are the owner of a blue Honda truck, that's what I've been told. Uh, if you have a large blue car, maybe that's your car. Uh, I don't know what the license plate is. Um, and so please, uh, if you can, uh, move your car at this time, that would be much appreciate. No one's moving, so maybe it's like yeah, none, of, none of our cars. Uh, but again, once again, if you have a blue uh, truck or so, if you can move your car, uh, that would be great. Hopefully that uh, gets resolved. Uh, but yeah, welcome again to Family Chapel. My name is Josh. I'm one of the pastors here uh, at FC, and I do have uh, the great privilege of sharing God's Word with us. And uh, today we're actually wrapping up our series through the book of Exodus. Uh, we started way back in April, and five and a half months later or so, here we are. Uh, we've come to the end of this amazing book, and what a journey it's been. Uh, we've seen God rescue his people out of sin, slavery, and death from Egypt. Uh, we've seen God miraculously provide for his people as they, as they make their way through the wilderness. He's brought for them manna and quail and water. Uh, we've seen God provide instructions for his people for how they are to live, how they're to carry out his mission. Uh, we've seen God form his people into a nation and enter into covenant with them. And most recently, through the golden calf incident that we've been covering for the past couple of weeks, we've seen God extend mercy to his people, even when they break covenant with him, even when they fall into sin and idolatry. Uh, well, as we kind of wrap things up today with our final sermon in this series, uh, we're going to circle back to the main theme of this entire book, which is God's glory. Right, God's glory. God's glory has taken center stage throughout this entire storyline in the book of Exodus. It's been the driving motivation behind everything that God has done, from saving his people, to providing for them, to instructing them, to forming them as a nation, to extending them mercy. It's all been driven by his glory. Uh, now, the same is true in, in our lives as well as Christians. And for those of us who have grown up in the church who have been Christians for some time now, we know that God's glory is to take Center stage, like we know the chief and the man is to glorify God and to enjoy him forever. We talk about it all the time in sermons. We sing about it in our songs. We pray about it in our prayers. We know that God's glory is to be this driving force for our lives. But what actually is God's glory? I mean, if you were to kind of explain or describe or define what God's glory is to someone else, like what would you say? Now, as you think about that, you might realize, oh, that's kind of hard to, to define, <laughs> It's a little bit abstract. It's a little bit hard because it's so broad. It's kind of like trying to define what beauty is or what art is uh, or what the color blue is. Right? It's a little bit hard to, to define what God's glory is. Uh, well, thankfully, uh, in our passage for today, we actually get a, uh, an amazing view as to what the glory of God is. And that's what we're hoping to explore in our passage for today. What exactly is God's glory? How are we to understand the glory of God? And how does God's glory shape and move our lives. Well, if you have a Bible with you, uh, we'll be uh, wrapping up the, uh, the book of Exodus uh, by looking at Exodus chapter 40. But before we get there, we'll actually be backtracking just a bit uh, to Exodus chapters 33 and 34. And in our passages for today, we're, we're going to be seeing three incredible aspects of God's glory. Uh, just to catch us up to speed, I, I do see some new faces, so maybe you're like, man, I'm just dropping in. I have no idea what you guys are talking about. But just kind of catch us up to speed. Uh, last week, uh, we saw Moses making this appeal to God's grace. Remember, the people have crafted this golden calf as an idol. They've broken covenant with God. They've sinned against God. And so Moses is appealing to God's grace so that God would make atonement for the people's sins in order to reconcile that broken relationship. Now, that was an audacious request. Moses asked God, would you pay on behalf of the people's mistakes? Well, as audacious as that request was, here in our passage, Moses makes an even more audacious request. Here, Moses asks for God to reveal his glory to him. Now, in the context of this narrative, Moses makes this request because he wants reassurance that God will indeed do what he has promised to do. Remember, again, by making atonement, by entering into this reconciliation, God has promised to be with his people and to lead them into the promised land. 
Well, Moses wants reassurance that God will uphold his promises. And so he asks God, hey, let me see you face to face. All right, let me look into your eyes, in, that, in, in a sense, and let me make sure that you will be true to these promises. Let me see your glory. It may be kind of similar to how a, a groom and a bride come together for a wedding ceremony. And they're at the altar. They stand in close proximity with each other. They look into each, to each other's eyes. They see each other face to face as they make these promises to one another. There's something about that proximity uh, that brings forth the reality of these promises. And so that's what Moses wants. Uh, and so he asks God, okay, please show me your glory. So take a look at Exodus chapter 33, verses 17 to 18. If I can just have the mic just a tad bit lower, that'd be great. Thank you. All right, it says this. And the Lord said to Moses, okay, the Lord said to Moses, this very thing that you have spoken, right, referring to making amends and being with the people in the promised land, uh, this very thing that you have spoken, I will, do for, I will do, for you have found favor in my sight, and I know you by name. And Moses said, please show me your glory. Here again, Moses asks to see God's glory. Now, what's interesting to me, uh, and maybe you're catching on to this, uh, what's interesting is that Moses has already seen various manifestations of God's glory. I mean, all throughout this narrative, Moses has beheld God's glory, whether it was at the burning bush, whether it was with the ten plagues in Egypt, whether it was with the parting of the Red Sea, whether it was with the manna and the quail, whether it was with the pillar of fire, whether it was on Mount Sinai, there have been so many instances where Moses has beheld the glory of God. In fact, I think in all of human history, there are maybe just a handful of people who have had more exposure to God's glory than Moses has had. And yet, even though Moses has, has had all these experiences of God's glory, he knows that there is still more to see. And so he asks God to receive an unfiltered view of his glory. He wants a full revelation of God's beauty and majesty and splendor and holiness. And, and here, uh, we see the first incredible aspect of God's glory. Here's point number one. The glory of God simultaneously, paradoxically, it satisfies and it stirs a hunger for more. At the same time, it satisfies the deepest longings of our hearts, even as it stirs a deeper hunger, a deeper appetite for even more of God's glory. See, God's glory functions in this paradoxical way where on the one hand, it, it meets the deepest longings of our hearts. As we saw with Moses' past experiences with God's glory, God's glory grants us a secure identity. Moses, this is who you are. I know you've run away from your home. I know you feel like you're a fugitive. You have no place to belong, but this is who you are. God's glory gives us a clearer sense of vision and purpose for life. Moses, this is what I want you to do with the rest of your life. I want you to go back to Egypt to lead my people out of slavery, to bring them into the promised land. God's sense of glory gives a, a sense of comfort and courage, even in the face of life's hardest circumstances. Right, as Moses is struggling with the people, God shows up and he reminds Moses, Moses, I am with you. Don't be afraid. I know you're fighting against the Amalekites. I know you're fighting against these people, but I am with you. And God's sense of glory gives us wisdom, imparts wisdom to our lives as we have important decisions to be made. Right? As Moses is trying to lead the people, God's glory descends once again at Mount Sinai. He says, here, here's how I want the people to live in covenant with me. There is a sense in which it satisfies us. God's glory satisfies us through and through. And yet, on the other hand, God's glory grows in us an appetite for even more. This is the wonderful paradox of God's glory. The glory of God profoundly satisfies us, and yet at the same time, it stirs within us a powerful longing for more. It's kind of like uh, if you've been craving something for a long time, right? Maybe you've been away on a, on a trip or on vacation, right? and it's just been weeks since you've had Korean food or Mexican food or fun. I'm just naming all my favorite foods, right? It's just been weeks. But finally, the day comes, and you have this food that you've been craving for. Now, when you take that first bite, it's like, ah, oh, yes. This is exactly what I wanted to eat. There's a satisfaction that comes. And yet, as you take that first bite, there is a stirring of hunger for more. And so you take another bite, and then another bite, and then another bite. And before you know it, you've eaten 10 tacos. And you're like, man, what am I doing with my life? But, but that's beside the point. Not a true story. Right? But the same is true of God's glory. The more we experience God's glory, the more we hunger for God's glory. And thankfully, God's glory can truly satisfy us even as we hunger for more because his glory is inexhaustible. And we see this in how God responds to Moses. Right? Moses makes this audacious request. He says, God, show me your glory. 
Well, God agrees and says, okay, Moses, I will show you my glory, but there has to be some boundaries here because you cannot view my unfiltered glory and live. It's too much for you. And so here's what I'm going to do, right? Take a look at Exodus chapter 33, verses 20 to 23. God makes arrangements for Moses to get a real but partial view of his glory. And it says this, God says to Moses, I'll show you my glory, but you cannot see my face for man shall not see me and live. And the Lord said, Behold, there is a place by me where you shall stand on the rock, and while my glory passes by, I will put you in a cleft, in a little crevice of the rock, and I will cover you with my hand until I have passed by. Then I will take away my hand, and you shall see my back, but my face shall not be seen. Here again, God tells Moses that a direct view of his glory would be too much. And so what he's going to do is he's going to have Moses come up back to Mount Sinai. He's going to place him in this little cleft, this little crevice this little crack in the mountain, and God's going to pass his glory by. But as he does so, he's going to impede or block or obstruct Moses' view so that the only thing Moses can see is a passing trail of God's glory. Right, God says, you can't see my face and lift, so I'm going to use my hand to block my face, and then you'll only see my back. Now, of course, God is using metaphorical language here. God is spirit. He doesn't have a literal face or a literal hand or a literal back. But in using this metaphorical language, God is explaining to Moses that all that Moses can handle in his finite, fallen humanity on this side of eternity is but an obscured glimpse of God's passing glory. Anything more than that, and Moses would just pass out dead. He would be utterly overwhelmed. He doesn't have the capacity to handle all of God's glory. And again, that shows us that God's glory is an infinite splendor that we cannot even begin to imagine wrapping our heads around. And I hope that actually serves as an encouragement for us. You know, I think for a lot of us, we can find ourselves settling for a very mediocre version of Christianity. What do I mean by that? I think for a lot of us, as we examine our own walk with Christ, we realize, man, it's kind of whatever's. It's kind of mid, as the kids like to say these days. As it's eh, right? But it is what it is. And as we kind of examine the present state of our walk with Christ, we can find ourselves kind of thinking back to the good old days, maybe back when we were in college or back when we were in youth group, maybe back when we were on that mission trip or we were at that retreat or at that conference or wherever it might be, and we think back to, to how passionate we used to be about God's glory. And we kind of settle for the fact that that explosive experience of God's glory is for the past. It's from when I was younger. It's for when I had more time. It's so before I had kids and I had a life, right? It's before, before all this craziness and busyness in my life has happened. It's for the past, and it will never be as good as it used to be. And we kind of settle for a mediocre Christianity. But I want you to know that your best days are ahead of you, not behind you. And the reason for that is because God's glory is a never-ending treasure trove. You have not come anywhere close to exhausting the wonders of knowing God. And so ask audaciously, as Moses asked audaciously, God, show me your glory. Show me your glory as a student. Give me a vision for life that goes far beyond just earning good grades and landing a nice internship and having a cool job. God, show me your glory as a post-grad. Fill me with an excitement that goes beyond just living for the weekend. Ground me into a, a more glorious reality in which my identity can be found and be stable in the midst of all of these life transitions. God, show me your glory as a parent. Lead me with renewed joy when the days are long and I feel spent. I am tired. I'm exhausted. I'm worried about my kids. God, show me your glory. And God, show me your glory in my retirement. In these last chapter of life, fill me with a renewed wonder and awe to give it my best in the time that I have left. Audaciously ask to see more of God's glory because we have only barely just begun to scratch the surface. In fact, we will spend the rest of eternity mining the unending depths of God's glory and each new layer that is uncovered will be even more glorious than the one that came before it. So we've seen that God's glory, paradoxically, satisfies our deepest longings, and yet at the same time, it stirs in us a hunger, an appetite for even more. And God's glory can live within this paradox because it is infinitely immense. We will never exhaust searching its depths. Now, those are some awesome truths when it comes to the glory of God, but we have still yet to answer what actually is God's glory. 
I mean, you've told me this amazing thing about God's glory, but, but what is at the heart of the glory of God? We actually get a clearer sense as the day arrives for Moses to behold God's glory. See, when the day comes for, for Moses to behold God in the fullness of his glory, God descends on Mount Sinai, and God's glory is revealed in a very surprising way. Remember, again, Moses has asked God to reveal his glory because he wants reassurance. God, you've promised to be with us. You've promised to take us into the promised land. There's all kinds of nations and enemies that are out there. I don't know if we're going to actually inhabit that land. Right? I want some reassurance that what you have promised is going to be true. Now, in this kind of context, you might imagine that God, as the king of Israel, in being asked to reveal his glory, in being asked to give some reassurance that he will faithfully carry out what he has called to do, what he has promised to do, uh, you might imagine that in revealing his glory, God would display something like his power. All right, Moses, you, you want to trust me? Well, here's my power. Look at my sovereignty. Look at my might. All right, look at my armies, my chariots, my weapons. Look at my power. Or maybe in this context, you, you might imagine God revealing his glory. He, he would do so by displaying his wealth. Oh, you want to trust that I can do this? Well, look at all the resources that are at my disposal. Anything that you can imagine, all the money that you wish you had, I, I have it at my fingertips. Right, we might imagine that in revealing his glory, God would either display his power or his possessions. But that's not what God shows Moses. See, when the day comes for God to reveal his glory to Moses, what God shows to Moses is his goodness. More than his power, more than his possessions, God shows Moses his goodness. Right? Going back to that conversation that Moses has with God and asking to see his glory, God responds by telling Moses this in Exodus 39, verse 19. And God said to Moses, right, you want to see my glory? Okay, well, I will make all my goodness pass before you. And I will proclaim before you my name, the Lord, Yahweh. And I will be gracious to whom I will be gracious. And I will show mercy on whom I will show mercy. And here we arrive at the heart of God's glory. Here's point number two. The glory of God is the goodness of God. The glory of God is the goodness of God. The glory of God is the beauty, the radiance, the splendor, the majesty of God's goodness. It's the public display of his interior goodness. Now, like I mentioned before, that's great and all, but goodness is still kind of hard to define, right? Okay, like you just substituted one abstract idea for, for another abstract idea, Josh. Well, thankfully, in, in revealing his glory, God actually presents seven attributes that fill out his glorious goodness. He kind of connects the dots for us so that we can better understand what he means by his goodness, right? If you take a look at Exodus chapter 34, verses 5 through 7, the day has come, God descends on Mount Sinai, he reveals his goodness to Moses, and he narrates these seven attributes. And it says this, Exodus 34, 5 through 7, and the Lord descended in the cloud and stood with him there, and he proclaimed the name of the Lord. And the Lord passed before him and proclaimed, the Lord, the Lord, a God merciful and gracious, slow to anger, abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness, keeping steadfast love for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin, but who will by no means clear the guilty, visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children and the children's children to the third and the fourth generation. Here we see that as God passes before Moses, he narrates seven attributes of his glorious goodness. And we're going to go through each of these things very briefly. First, God shows himself to be merciful. Now, this means that God is compassionate. This means that when life is rough, instead of reacting by telling you, to, hey, just suck it up, move on, what God does is he draws near in compassion. He's compassionately close. In his goodness, God is merciful. Secondly, God shows himself to be gracious. This means that God treats us far better than we actually deserve. Now, some of us might have a hard time believing this because we feel like God is not treating us as we deserve. Because if he did, then I would have landed that job by now. If he did, then I would have had that relationship by now. We feel so entitled sometimes to good things in our lives because we feel like we've earned it. And yet, the reality is, in our sinfulness, the only thing we actually deserve is condemnation. But thankfully, God does not give us what we deserve. He gives us more than we deserve. The very fact that you are alive today, that you have breath in your lungs, you have strength for another day, it is all of grace. In his goodness, God is gracious. Secondly, or thirdly rather, God shows himself to be slow to anger. What that means is that God is utterly patient with us. 
his response when we fall into sin is not initially one of frustration or annoyance, but it's one of patiently holding out grace. Also, he's not quick to rush us along when we are in the pit of despair or when our faith feels weak. He doesn't say, hey, what's wrong with you, man? Get your act together. No, he is willing to walk at our slow pace. He's not bothered by our stumbles and our falls. He's content to sit with us in our doubts, to linger with us in our confusion. In his goodness, God is patient. He's slow to anger. Fourth, God shows himself to be abounding in steadfast love. This means that God cannot love you any more, nor can he love you any less, because he already loves you perfectly and consistently. His love for you is not contingent on the behavior that you had this past week. If you've done great things for him, it doesn't mean that he loves you more. If you've done terrible things against him, that doesn't mean that he loves you any less. No, he has a steadfast love for you. It is constant and consistent. In his goodness, God is steadfast in love. Fifth, God shows himself to be faithful. This means that God always follows through on his promises. God is true to his word. What he has said, he will most certainly do. And so we can bank our lives on his promises. In his goodness, God is faithful. Sixth, God shows himself to be forgiving. What that means is that when we repent of our sins, God is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. We turn to him in faith and say, God, I mess up. I'm sorry. God offers us pardon. And when he pardons our sins, he does not hold our sins against us. He does not dig up dirt from the past to bring against us. He doesn't hold on to to, uh, resentment or bitterness. But when he forgives us, he fully forgives us. In his graciousness, in his goodness, rather, God is forgiving. And seventh, God shows himself to be just. This means that God does not let sin slide, but he will bring forth righteous judgment. Now, we might wish that God had stopped at the first six attributes and kind of left the seventh one off the table, but it's here. And if you think about it, it's really good that it's here. Because imagine if God were unjust, if God did not care about evil and injustice in the world, if God took bribes and showed partiality to the rich and the powerful, if God left our world as a crooked and broken mess, but rather because God is just, he will make all things right. He will make all things new. He will make sure that justice will prevail. In his goodness, God is just. And so here, Moses has asked to see God's glory, and what God shows Moses is his goodness. The totality of his perfections as captured by these seven attributes. And in a sense, by doing this, God is communicating to Moses, all right, you want to know if you can trust me to lead the people into the promised land? Well, here you go. You can trust me, not just because I am powerful and in sovereign control over all of creation. You can trust me, not just because I am fabulously wealthy and have all the resources at my fingertips, but you can trust me Because I am good, I'm merciful and gracious, slow to anger, full of steadfast love, full of faithfulness, ready to forgive. I will uphold justice. I am good, and so you can trust me. And ultimately, we see the clearest revelation of God's glorious goodness in Jesus himself. Hebrews chapter 1 Jesus is described as being the radiance, the full radiance of the glory of God. Jesus shines with all the fullness of God's glorious goodness. And as wild as this may sound, in seeing Christ by faith, we actually get a far greater glimpse of God's glory than Moses even got. Moses, at best, got a fading glimpse. We, by faith, through the Holy Spirit, we now get front row seats to behold God's glory in the face of Christ. Now, of course, on this side of eternity, our view is partial. It is incomplete. So often it is impeded by our sin and our lack of faith. But one day, our faith will be made into perfect sight. As the Apostle Paul writes in 1 Corinthians 13, yes, for now we see in a mirror dimly, but then one day we shall see him face to face. And when that day comes, we will see Jesus up close and personal. And what a sight it will be. We will behold Christ In the fullness of his glorious goodness, our faith will turn to sight. Our hearts will be utterly captivated by his glory. And I don't know about you, but I long to see that day when I finally get to see Jesus face to face. When we finally see in full what we can only see in part. And when that day comes, we will be utterly blown away by his glorious goodness. 
All right, well, now that we have a better sense as to what God's glory is, we're going to wrap up our sermon. We haven't even gone to the main passage, but I promise this last part's going to be short. Um, uh, we've seen that um, God's, uh, God's glory uh, incites this, this satisfaction in our hearts, and yet at the same time, paradoxically, it stirs in us a hunger for more. And also, God's glory is ultimately God's very goodness. But as we wrap up, we're going to take a look at the final few verses in the book of Exodus. I see, after God restores the people following the whole golden calf incident, uh, the people rally together, they contribute their resources, their skills, and they actually end up building the tabernacle. Right? Every piece is expertly crafted, every piece in its, is set in its proper place. And after the tabernacle is completed, God's glory descends and fills the tabernacle. And what a fitting end to the book of Exodus. Right? If you remember, Exodus began with a people isolated, captured, bonded in slavery. And it tells the story of God rescuing his people so that they can be with him and experience his glory. And this story ends as God forms this redeemed people into a nation and he dwells with them in his glorious goodness. And we see this in the concluding verses of the book of Exodus. If you take a look at Exodus chapter 40, verses 34 to 38, the last part of our passage, it says this. Then the cloud covered the tent of meeting. This is the tabernacle. And the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. And Moses was not able to enter the tent of meeting because the cloud settled on it and the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. And throughout all their journeys, whenever the cloud was taken up from over the tabernacle, the people of Israel would set out. But if the cloud was not taken up, then they did not set out till the day that it was taken up. For the cloud of the Lord was on the tabernacle by day and fire was in it by night in the sight of all the house of Israel throughout all their journeys. So as we just read, after the Israelites set up the tabernacle, uh, God's glory descends and fills this tabernacle. It takes up this form of a cloud by day and a pillar of fire by night. And God's glory plays a very important function as the Israelites continue their journey through the wilderness. See, God's glory would kind of move and dictate where the Israelites would go. And so if it stayed put, then the people would stay put. But if it moved on ahead, then the people would follow after it and move on ahead. And in this way, God's glory would guide the people all the way home to their promised land. And here we see the third and final point of today's sermon. The glory of God guides us as we make our way home. The glory of God guides us as we make our way home, as we trek across the perilous wilderness filled with all kinds of challenges, setbacks, discouragements, temptations, distractions, all kinds of things. We can safely arrive at the promised land as we fix our eyes on God's glorious goodness. And if Jesus is the radiance of God's glory, then oh how we need to fix our eyes on Jesus as we make our way home. See, the only way we can be faithful in the grind of the mundane, especially when no one seems to care or notice or give appreciation, is by fixing your eyes on Jesus. The only way we can keep putting one foot in front of the other, even when we are shaken to the very core after receiving that scary diagnosis from the doctor's office, is by fixing our eyes on Jesus. The only way that we can say no to sin and a thousand other temptations that are so alluring is by fixing our eyes on Jesus. The only way we can say yes to God's call on our lives, even when that call fills us with trembling and fear because it feels so grand and overwhelming, is by fixing our eyes on Jesus. Because in seeing Jesus, we get to see God's glorious goodness. And it's God's glorious goodness that fills us with courage and hope and joy as we make our way through the wilderness of life. It fills us with hope to keep pressing on until we finally arrive home. Now, unlike the Israelites, we don't have a literal pillar of cloud or a pillar of fire guiding us. Some of us wish, man, that would make my life so much easier. I would know where to go, what job to take, where to live, who to marry, so on and so forth. But the actuality is we have actually been gifted something far better. We've been gifted the Holy Spirit. And one of the main jobs of the Holy Spirit is to illuminate our hearts by faith so that we can see Jesus all the more clearly in the fullness of his glory. And so here's a simple application for us. Would you ask God, or would you ask the Holy Spirit, God the Holy Spirit, to help you to see Jesus all the more clearly? Would you ask God the Holy Spirit to illuminate your mind and your heart to more fully, more clearly see God's glorious goodness in the face of Christ? 
Now, there's a lot more that we can say about that, and our, actual, uh, our next sermon series will actually dive more deeply into this idea of, of the Holy Spirit helping us to see Jesus and become more like Jesus. Uh, but just at a baseline level, we're just asking the Holy Spirit to draw our attention and our affections more towards Christ, to put Jesus at the forefront of our lives day after day. And when we have such a clear vision of his glorious goodness, that actually enables us to press on until we arrive home. So fix your eyes on Jesus. You know, this past week, I um, got a very unexpected message from a church member. Uh, this church member has a family friend who's staying in hospice care. If you don't know what hospice care is, it's pretty much end-of-life care. Uh, it's where someone goes when there's really no other treatment options, and they're just kind of waiting it out. Uh, now, the reason why this church member called me is because the staff at the hospice care place told him that this family friend had stopped eating or drinking, and so her time was probably coming to a close. She's 89 years old, has dementia. She's been at this hospice care place for the past two years or so. And so in receiving that call, uh, this church member reached out to me and said, hey, can you come and just pray with us? So I went. Now, uh, I've been a pastor for 10 years, but these kind of things are still pretty rare for me. I'm still fairly young. So I didn't really know what to expect. Right, was she going to be awake? Uh, was she going to be alert? Is she going to be attentive? I mean, she hasn't been eating or drinking for the past couple of days. Like, what's it going to be like in the room? Uh, well, thankfully, as we kind of walked into her room, um, she woke up. Now, the staff told us that the past couple of days, she had been sleeping for, for about 20 hours each day. But thankfully, we had this little window of time to just talk with her. And so we were talking for about 15, 20 minutes, just, you know, catching up, um, getting to know one another. Um, but eventually, we prayed. And in that room, we prayed for comfort in the midst of pain. And we, pay, we, we pray for peace in the midst of fear. But above all, we, we pray that Jesus would be near. So we prayed these things. And afterwards, you know, we're, we're continuing to talk. And it's awkward because we don't really know what to say. Uh, but we asked her, hey, how, how are you feeling? Are you okay? Um, and I don't know if she can kind of sense the, the uneasiness in, in our tone of voice or in the look of our face. Because after all, we've been told, man, she, she has maybe a few more days left to live. But with a glint in her eye, she looked at us. And this was the clearest she had spoken the entire time. She said, don't worry. I'll be okay. Don't worry. I'll be okay. Now, I can't read her mind. But I do wonder if the reason why those courageous words came out of her mouth was because even in the face of death, she had set her eyes on the face of Christ. So there was nothing to worry about, nothing to fear, because in the truest sense, she would be okay. Friends, that's the only way we can make it home, by fixing our eyes on Jesus. So church, may we do just that. I know so many, so many people in this room have stories of pain and hurt. You're in the middle of, of conflict. You have all kinds of uncertainties ahead of you. You don't know what's, what's in store. Set your eyes on Jesus. He will take you home, not merely because he is so powerful and sovereign, and not merely because he has all the resources in the world, but primarily because he is good. He is gloriously good. And so rest in his mercy. Rest in his grace. Rest in his patience. Rest in his steadfast love. Rest in his forgiveness. Rest in his justice. Make your way home as you trust in Jesus who is gloriously good. And what better way to fix our eyes on Christ than through communion? Today is the final Sunday of the month, and so we'll be celebrating communion today. Uh, if you would like to participate, uh, you can grab one of the individually packaged elements from uh, Hannah in the back. Um, but just as a, a reminder as to what communion is, communion is just a, a tangible reminder of the gospel. And so as we get ready to participate in communion, would you take a moment to prepare your hearts by remembering Christ? Just remember his goodness as you recall to mind all the ways in which he is gracious and merciful and patient and loving, kind and faithful. And as you remember his glorious goodness, would that fill you with a renewed sense of courage and hope and joy, 
to make it through the wilderness of life. To trust that he is leading you home because he is good. Let's take a moment now to prepare our hearts as we get ready to receive communion together.